Okay, so for today, we're going to start a new chapter, and this is all about pro-social behavior. So there's several concepts that we're going to talk about this that in everyday conversation, people use interchangeably. Okay, so people use the word like altru like altruistic, altruism, pro-social behavior, pro-social acts. A lot of people use all of these kind of things interchangeably, but they actually do mean different things. So what we're going to talk about is some main psychological theories of why we help. Like what is helping behavior? So if you see like your neighbor who has fallen, you know, going over and, and making sure they're okay. If you see somebody who's struggling with a big box, you know, going over and helping them carry the box. If you see somebody in a fire in a house and running into the house and, you know, saving them, these are all examples of pro-social or of helping behaviors, okay? Um, when we talk about the sort of scope, you can, you know, do as something as little as, um, you know, pick up a piece of paper that someone dropped to saving someone's life. So, you know, where, why is it that we do these things? What are the theories that explain how we, and why we engage in helping behavior? We're going to talk about individual differences and why some people are more likely to help than others. Um, we're going to talk about the situation. Remember, social psychology is all about the context. So the, con the, the context of the situation is also very important in understanding the likelihood of somebody helping. And then you're going to learn for yourself how you can be in situations that might actually increase the likelihood of you helping depending on what's going on. So first, we need to talk about the difference between pro-social behavior and altruism. So pro-social behavior, think of it as like an umbrella term. So pro-social behavior is any kind of helping behavior. This is any act perform, performed that's gonna benefit someone else. It doesn't necessarily have to benefit you, but it could benefit you. This is any kind of helping behavior that's gonna benefit or help someone else, okay? We call this an umbrella term because it includes pretty much everything. It's a very big scope, right? It's from literally picking that piece of paper up and handing it to somebody who dropped it to running into a burning building and saving a bunch of people, okay? So it's it's definitely, you know, it's, it's a broad and everything in between, it's a broad scope. Now, a lot of times when we think about pro-social acts um, and helping behavior, we think about um, for example, 9-11. So during 9-11, there was um, a man whose name was Rick Rescorla, and he was the head of security for a brokerage form, firm. And so when the first plane hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center, he um, actually uh, told the employees to remain at their desks um, because he was trained in um, emergencies, like getting people out based, you know, for a varying wider range of situations. And so um, they were all instructed to, to, you know, to stay at their desks and he knew that something was going on. Okay. So they, they were given the instructions, everybody stay. And so what he did was he sort of jumped into action. Okay. And so what he did is he had a plan and his employees, because remember he was head of security, um, they, they knew what to do because he had sort of enacted this plan over and over again. And his plan was find a partner, um, don't go down the elevators and evacuate the building. That was always like a plan. So if there was a fire, if there was an explosion, if there was something that's what his, um, his instructions always were to his employees. Um, so even though they were all told to stay where they were, um, where Scorla said, no, we're going to enact our plan. We're going to do this. And so he like immediately went into action and said, everybody get your, get your partner, go, you know, avoid the elevator, get out of the building. And so when the plane hit the South tower, he was on the 44th floor supervising this evacuation. So he was supervising his employees getting out. He was trying to make sure everybody had partnered up and everybody was getting out of the building. And so he actually had a bullhorn and was um, telling people, you know, to remain calm, to, to evacuate the building. And remember, he's on the 44th floor, okay? And at this time, you know, the plane had already hit the building. <clears throat> After most of the employees had made it out of the building, he decided to go ahead and go back and do a final sweep of the offices to make sure that nobody was left behind. Well, when he went back, the South Tower collapsed and he and he died 
going back to ensure that nobody was left in the in the building. And so um, in the end, it was it was figured out that he was actually credited with saving the lives of 3,700 employees. He had guided all of those employees to safety and risked his own life and died in, um, in, in to save all of those people. Um, so, you know, the question is, is why would someone risk their life to save other people? You know, why is it that we engage in these kinds of behaviors? Why risk helping when it could be a detriment to yourself, either it could hurt you or it could kill you or it can put you in some kind of danger. So social psychologists are very fascinated with this idea of pro-social behavior and how is it that you do something that might benefit someone else but has no benefit or even a detriment to you? Why is it that we do that? If we can look at other examples uh, during 9-11. So uh, if you look at United Flight 93, that was a hijacked plane we know based off of the accounts of the phone calls um, right, right after it was hijacked, for, so the, the uh, passengers actually were calling their family members and explaining what was happening. Um, there were several passengers, three in particular, Todd Beamer, Jeremy Glick, and Thomas Burnett. They all had very young children. They were, they were fathers of young children. They actually stormed the cockpit and um, and they overpowered the terrorists. And because they couldn't prevent the plane um, from, uh, they, they actually couldn't prevent the plane from crashing, but they could prevent, they could have, they did prevent it from being worse. And so the plane was headed for Washington, DC. They didn't know this at the time, but they actually prevented a much worse tragedy. Um, and even though everybody on board died because they, the, the, the plane crashed, um, they probably saved thousands of lives more because they decided to, to bring the plane down or at least to, to over um, over on the terrace who hijacked the plane. So again, it's one of those things where, you know, you're trying to understand why is it that these, these people risked their lives knowing that they're going into a situation where they might die or they might get hurt. Um, and, you know, in the end, thankfully, all these thousands of lives were saved. Um, but how is it that we explain this behavior? Um, so when we talk about pro-social behavior, remember that's the umbrella term. So if I say pro-social behavior, I mean any kind of behavior, whether or not it benefits you. So sometimes we engage in pro-social behaviors and it benefits somebody else, but we're doing it because it's helpful to us, okay? And that doesn't necessarily mean it's like, worse, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. You know, you can, you know, sometimes they say, well, it's selfish to engage in pro-social behaviors if it's going to benefit you, whether it makes you feel good or whether it is, you know, you know it later that somebody else is going to repay you a favor. Um, it's still benefiting someone else. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Now, there is a, a, a portion of pro-social behaviors underneath this, under this big pro-social umbrella called um, altruistic acts. So altruism, is when you help somebody else, right? Where there's either no benefit to you or there's a cost to this helping behavior. So for example, when we look at the acts of Todd Beamer, Jeremy Glick, Thomas Burnett, when we look at Rick Rescorla, these are all altruistic acts because what happened was, was they helped at a at a cost to themselves and they, they, it costs their life, right? So an altruistic act would be one that is a behavior um, that helps somebody else that either doesn't benefit you at all, or it is a cost to you, okay? And altruism is that desire to help people, even if there's a cost that comes to the person who's helping, okay? So how is it that we explain these, these behaviors, okay? So we can come at this and I'm going to come at this from three different angles. So I'm going to come at this from the angle of um, evolutionary psych. I'm going to give you guys some other kind of uh, theories as to why it is that we engage in these kinds of behaviors. Okay. So first, well, let's look at this from the evolutionary psychology perspective. If we look at Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, right? Basically, he wrote that natural selection favors genes that promote the survival of an individual. So um, if you have a particular behavior that's been sort of passed down, that's there's a particular genetic trait to that behavior, and it's been passed down from generation to generation, the idea is, is the reason why it gets, it continues to get passed down is because it's beneficial to the 
species. So having opposable thumbs, for example, is incredibly beneficial to the human species because we can grasp things, we can make things, we can make tools, we can, um, you know, do uh, a lot with opposable thumbs. A lot of um, uh, evolutionary uh, biologists like to use uh, principles of evolutionary theory to explain social behaviors like aggression and altruism. Okay. So for example, um, it may not be beneficial to the species to have an overly aggressive uh, gene, because if that's the case, then if we, for example, kill our own young or we, you know, kill other people, that can be harmful to the survival of the species. And so humans are very social beings and, you know, it helps us to have um, a, a network, right? It helps us to have a family support system because it helps our survival. Because if someone gets injured, someone else can get food. If somebody, you know, is, for example, having a baby and they're pregnant and they're not really able to do much once in, you know, and they have that baby, and they're not really able to be mobile, then other family unit members can help that person. And that's going to improve the survival of the mother and the baby. And it's just, we can use them. There's just countless examples of why it's important for humans to be social creatures. And that's something that we can explain why we fall in love, why we, um, enjoy uh, um, other people's company. You know, why is it that we feel sad when we're rejected? You know, because for the human species, it's beneficial for us to be in units, to be together as in groups, okay? It helps our survival. Um, if you, you know, toss five people out into the, the forest and tell them to survive, they have a lot better chance of survival than taking one person and putting them out in the forest. Okay. Um, because everybody can use their skills and help each other, especially if someone gets injured or if somebody, um, is, you know, needs help. So, um, a lot of times we use these evolutionary perspectives to explain certain kinds of behaviors. Um, so for example, love, uh, and connection and attachment to your young. Um, you know, if you didn't, if you looked at your baby and you said, wow, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Ew, here, take it. You're not going to take care of that baby. Okay. But instead what we do is we look at the baby and we're like, oh my God, I love this baby. And we have all these hormones that are, um, are beneficial to us and they make us bond with the baby so that that way we don't just, you know, toss it off and say, Oh, I don't want to take care of this baby. No, instead you look at the baby, you're like, this is the most beautiful thing I ever see in the world. And then you become very protective over it. And that helps the survival of the, um, of the infant and then helps the survival of the, of the um, mother as well. Um, okay. So hormones, I got a question in chat. What about hormonal imbalances in mothers that can be problematic because if you have, for example, postpartum depression, then that can be, um, risky for both the mother and the baby, because maybe the mother doesn't want to take care of the baby or the mother can't take care of herself. Well, this is why it's important to be in a social unit, because if, for example, you have another person who is able to care for the, the infant and help that person through that, that, um, that, that imbalance, then that ensures the survival of the mother and the baby. So if there is a, you know, if, if we're talking about like a village, right. And then we have, uh, other family members or other members of the unit who are, um, sort of lactating, able to take the baby. Um, you know, these are things that can help with that situation is postpartum preventable. Um, so postpartum is in theory can be preventable, but I think more importantly, early detection is what's key. Being able to identify it early on and trying to understand how to help that mother infant um, pairing um, very quickly so that it doesn't become a really bad problem and it doesn't continue to escalate. Um, you know, when you have support systems, um, it's easier to, to uh, treat postpartum depression, it's easier to treat that because you have support and you have help and there's less stress on the mother um, when everyone's educated on it and, you know, things like that, that really helps um, to identify that, that issue early on. So, um, you know, it's always, you know, when everybody asks like, is depression preventable, is postpartum depression preventable? You know, I mean, in theory, it could be, and maybe we're going to get to the point where we could we can get there, but the situation 
can make the, the depression worse. So instead of in thinking about it being preventable, um, thinking about it uh, not escalating and not uh, being exacerbated by situations like additional stress, the mother feels isolated, doesn't have support. All of these things can make a situation that could be very treatable explode into a much worse situation. Now, when we talk about evolutionary psych in refer in reference to these kinds of social behaviors, okay? So evolutionary psychology, this is the attempt to explain social behavior in terms of genetic factors that have evolved over time according to the principles of natural selection. Any gene that furthers the survival, okay, and increases the possibility uh, probability of producing offspring should be passed on, right? That's the idea behind evolutionary psychology. Genes that have lower chances of survival and reduce the chances of, off of producing offspring are less likely to be passed on. So any situations where we see that um, something is not beneficial, we should see that kind of weed itself out because chances are that they are reproducing. So for example, if you have somebody who is very aggressive, very mean, um, and, uh, can't get a mate because nobody wants to mate with that person, right? Thinking about it from more of an animal perspective, um, then chances are that person's not going to be able to pass their genes along because they're not going to, their mate selection is not very good because, you know, they're, they're going to be cast out. Um, that's kind of like the idea behind it in a really simple way. Now, Darwin realized really early on that there was a problem with evolutionary theory. Okay. Um, and that it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't do a great job in explaining a lot of behaviors because it can only describe what a possibility could be. It doesn't really, um, we, there's no way to prove it. Well, there's no way to prove in, in science anyway, but there's no way to, to really test it. Right. Um, we can't just say, okay, let's see what this trait, you know, continues on in the next hundred thousand years. That's, oh, probably the the most longitudinal study of ever existence <laughs> you know we'd have to like do a study for a hundred thousand years so it's like it's too it's 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 impossible to really test these kinds of ideas um but we can look at what we see happening in current behavior and look at a potentially past behavior and see what might be um what might explain some of these behaviors and, and kind of piece things together so um if a person is ensuring their own survival. Okay. Why would you help if that's going to be a cost to you and cost to your survival? So if you are going to go rescue somebody out of a burning building, okay. Um, and you might die. Evolutionary psychology says it doesn't make sense because if you have an altruistic gene, let's say the gene, the traits that make you altruistic, that doesn't benefit your, your genetic line because if you go risk your life, you're not going to produce offspring if you die. Right. So it doesn't make sense to say that this is something that you do. Okay. Cause if evolutionary perspective had its way, altruism wouldn't exist. Right. But it does. So how can we explain it? Well, you would think that genes that promote selfish behavior would be more likely to be passed on again to benefit that person's genes from continuing to get passed on. But what, but if you think about it this way, okay, if that were the case, then those so selfish genes would continue to get passed on and altruism would essentially be bred out of us, right? Um, but we know that's not the case. So what we have instead is an attempt at an explanation of why this occurs from the evolutionary perspective, and that is kin selection. So kin selection is the idea that behaviors um, that help a genetic relative are going to be favored by natural selection. So even if it is going to be a cost to you, if you are going to risk your life to save a baby, your baby, if it's going to be a risk uh, to save a nephew, if it's going to be a risk to save somebody who's related to you, okay, that is protecting the genes to continue to get passed along, even if it's not you, yourself, and your child right? So because a person's blood relatives share some of their genes, 
that person is going to want to ensure their survival of those genes. And it's going to be a greater chance that those genes are going to flourish in the future if that person is protected, right? And this is actually reflected in the literature. And it turns out that um, when we look at real emergencies, okay, um, they're consistent with the finding in, in experimental research that asks people, would you be more likely to help a genetic relative than a non-relative in a life and death situation? So if I say to you, if there is a house fire, okay, are you going to be more likely to go rescue your two-year-old baby, or are you going to be more likely to go rescue your 80-year-old neighbor? your chance, the chance of you saying that you're going to rescue your baby is a whole lot higher than you saying that you're going to risk your life to rescue your 80 year old neighbor. Now, doesn't mean to say that some people would say, I would save both. I would try to save both. But if you had a choice in a life or death situation, more people report that they would save somebody who is genetically related to them. And when we look at real emergencies and we, we look at the, um, uh, the results of cases where we see people going in and risking their life, more times than not, they are saving gene genetic relatives. Now, one thing I do want to note here, okay, and this is important, and this is an important thing when it comes to evolutionary psych too, because a lot of people think that they're like, well, if I'm going to go run in a fire, I'm not going to say, well, is this person related to me, right? Um, it's not a conscious thing, right? It's not something that we say, well, let me, let me compute the likelihood of these genes getting passed along. It's kind of ingrained in us over many, many generations to want to help people who are genetically related to us. It's not like we just like, we see a fire and we go, hmm, you know, uh, I wonder if they're going to continue on passing my genes or passing their genes along. Should I go rescue them? Mm, okay. You know, sure. No, it's, it's not something that is like, even on a conscious level, it is something that is, uh, you know, kind of ingrained in our behavior. It's something that is, um, kind of built into our, our genes. So don't think that it's like an actual, like conscious decision where you're going to look at the fire and be like, Oh, you know, should I save this person? Um, so just to, just to clear that up, which I'm sure nobody was probably wondering that, but I just thought to clear it up anyway. So another explanation for why people help is this idea of norm of reciprocity. Okay. So <clears throat> People who understand that, you know, if I help you now, later on, you might be able to help me. Okay. This is the norm of reciprocity. So if you help your neighbor, chances are, let's say you help them move. Okay. Into their house. Okay. And then you say, well, I've kind of, I've helped them. So maybe when I'm in need in the future, they will also help me. Okay. And so this is something that could have become genetically based to help the species continue to survive because this idea of like the village, right? So, you know, they say, oh, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, because everybody is helping out and, and, you know, looking out for the kid. Um, and the idea is this sort of reciprocity, like you help this person, that person's going to help you. Um, so like, you know, it's, it's like the village concept, right? Um, and so that norm of reciprocity is a social norm. And if you guys remember, it's very beneficial for us as a human species to understand what social norms are and they change from generation to generation they change with culture shifts what the norm is and it'll and and if we look across kind of humans as a sort of as a species this norm of reciprocity really would exist everywhere because this is something that you would help somebody thinking that you're kind of you know, kind of racking up favors potentially, and that somebody hopefully will be able to help you later on. So it's a, it's a reciprocity. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I want to kind of think about here, and we're going to do a little exercise. So I want you guys to, to do the first um, question in chat or come off the of mute, whatever you like. Let's do these one at a time. Okay. So what I want to ask you guys is, have you ever received some kind of, um, 
letter or like uh, email or something, some kind of a, a fundraising appeal from a charity, but you were given a gift. So for example, if you, um, if you ever give to St. Jude, a lot of times um, you'll get on their list and they'll send you things like stickers, they'll send you um, return uh, <clears throat> like address labels so that if you uh, wanna you know, mail a letter, you can put your address label on there. Um, they'll send you notepads. Um, sometimes charities will send out um, little gift cards. Uh, has anybody ever received anything or maybe your parents received anything that you've never given to them, but the charity sent you something as a gift to say, you know, we would hope that you would like to give to our cause here is a little gift. Do you think that receiving a gift, okay, whether it's like um, address labels, stickers, notepads, just little things. Do you think that it would make you feel more inclined to give? So even if you personally haven't given to these charity causes, but maybe your parents are like, well, you know, I feel kind of guilty. Maybe I should go ahead and, you know, give them five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever. Um, then that feels like you have an obligation, right? You kind of feel like you should go ahead and give them something because they get, yep, here we go. I feel like it would make me feel obligated since they sent me something. This kind of operates on that principle of normal reciprocity. They're doing something nice to you in hopes that you're gonna give to their cause, right? It's a reciprocity, right? It's reciprocal. They give to you, now it's your turn you give to them. Does everybody see how that works? So it's actually a really fascinating um, technique. And, and it, it's, it's a way to kind of, well, one kind of makes you feel guilty, right? And also it makes you more likely to want to give because it's almost like, well, you want, you don't want to be in their debt, right? Now let's look at number two. Has anybody gotten a free sample from a product, a store, a company, whether it's through the mail or like you walk in and somebody hands you something? Um, did that, did, did when you got the sample, because I know everybody's gotten samples of something, right? When you got the sample, did it make you more likely to buy that product or to buy something from that company or store? So it's the same kind of idea with this norm of reciprocity. You are getting something, right, without giving anything. And now you're like, well, now I kind of feel obligated and indebted. And so you want to feel, you want this to be reciprocal, okay? Or if you liked it, you did. And some people, they're like, oh, if I didn't like the product, I didn't buy it. But you might felt like you had a bit of an obligation. So maybe you didn't feel, and I've got this in chat, it hasn't made me want to buy that thing specifically, but I would feel awful if I didn't buy at least something from the store if the sample um, was given in person, right? It's the same kind of thing. Like if you go into a, a restaurant or a bakery or something and you're like, oh, I'm just going to go use the bathroom. I'm not going to buy anything. And they're like, oh, Hey, here, here's a, you know, here's a mini croissant or something. And you're like, oh, wow, no, thanks. And they're like, no, 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 it's a sample. You can have it for free. And then you go in and you use their bathroom. And now you've, you've eaten some of their bakery items. And you're like, now I have to buy something because I just, you know, it's that feeling. You're just like, well, I have to do something now because I feel like, you know, um, I feel bad. So what do you guys think about your own situation and helping friends, for example? So can you think of a particular time when the reciprocity norm might have influenced how likely you were to help a friend? So for example, like a favor or something. So can you think of an example where you had a friend where the norm of reciprocity happened? Maybe they did something for you. Okay. When someone has helped me through something, it's my turn to help them in turn. Mm -hmm. And you kind of feel like maybe you're like, well, I helped them through that. So, you know, I'm going through this hard time and maybe you kind of call on them, right? Have you ever been in a situation where the expectation is that somebody comes through for you, but they don't? Okay. 
So somebody said, I felt this a lot in my last friendship. I was always the one giving, it makes me question my intention and in helping them in the first place, if it was for me or for them. Yeah, these are all really great comments. It's like you, you, you start to question your relationship with them, right? So whether or not it's like a significant other or just a friend or an acquaintance, you start asking yourself, you know, I, I don't feel like this relationship is balanced. And it's a problem. It can actually make you question, do you want to continue on having a relationship with this person? Um, so somebody says, I tend to give a lot, but not receive anything back. And sometimes, again, this can be a personality trait. And then you have to ask yourself, um, it, are my relationships reciprocal, right? So, you know, and sometimes that is reaching out and communicating with others to say, I feel like I give a lot, but I don't feel like I'm getting a lot in return. And, you know, being really open with, especially some of your really strong friendships, because then you know that they're not going to reject you for saying that you have needs, right? Um, just like somebody said here, it can feel like you're being used after a while. And it's important that we understand that there are specific social norms and we have been conditioned throughout our lives to understand social norms. And when you don't understand social norms, that's problematic, right? Um, and it results in things like poor relationship building. And it, it results in things like loneliness and isolation because you, you're not understanding what the rules are, right? So when we talk about us learning social norms, okay, it is adaptive for individuals to learn social norms from everyone else. Else. We need to know and be able to learn these very quickly so that we can be involved and uh, be accepted into society. Those people who learn these, uh, these, these social norms very quickly and very efficiently tend to have a survival advantage, right? So if you can get into a group and be accepted by that group very quickly, that's going to improve your chances of survival. That's going to improve your chances of acceptance and happiness and better quality of life. Um, so one particular norm, right, is uh, that people can learn is the value of helping other people. And so this is a valuable norm in all societies, regardless of culture, being able to um, understand social norms. We're sort of genetically programmed to learn social norms. And one of these norms is altruism, right? So it makes sense from the evolutionary perspective, if we consider this being a sort of a genetic link and trait, is that one, genetically conditioned over hundreds of thousands of, in, in you know, depending on far back, millions of years to understand and learn social norms. And number two, one of those social norms is helping behavior and, and altruism, right? So the ability to learn social norms is part of our genetic makeup. The fact that we, we want to uh, understand our society and understand what to do and what not to do, because if you don't understand what not to do, uh, you can get cast out and that's a survival issue, right? Now, one thing that's really interesting is to think about gratitude which is an emotion, right? So when somebody does something nice for you, you feel grateful, right? You feel gratitude. To think about this as an evolved emotion that facilitates reciprocity, right? So you feeling thankful that someone helped you is going to increase the likelihood that you're going to help them in the future. Same thing thing is we turn it around. If you help someone, they're going to feel gratitude towards you and they are going to want to help you in the future. So this reciprocity of back and forth of feeling gratitude is an emotion that's been ingrained in our being in order for us to continue this reciprocity and then continue the chances of survival for us as a species. Okay. And evolution favors groups whose members help each other. So those groups who understand reciprocity, who feel gratitude and are able to engage in those acts and favors are going to have a survival advantage. And so then what happens? That emotion, that gratitude, that reciprocity gets built back into our genetic traits and then continues on to be passed along from generation to generation. So even though originally we were thinking, well, Altruism can't be explained by evolutionary psychology. It turns out it absolutely can because these particular traits are beneficial, even though at first you think, well, there's a high cost in some cases, but overall there's more benefit than risk as a species. The difference between evolutionary approaches, okay, 
is that social exchange theory doesn't trace this desire of health and behavior back to evolutionary roots, and it does not assume that it's genetically based. Okay. So think of social exchange theory as being in the moment, right? It's being like you as a person, as a human experiencing life as it is right now. Okay. There are costs and rewards to helping people, right? There are costs and rewards to having a relationship with somebody. And I'm not talking about a romantic relationship. I'm just like a friendship, knowing somebody. Okay. So very basic. What are the costs or what are the rewards of having a relationship with somebody? So what do you guys think? Just generally speaking, like me knowing you, you knowing me, us not trying to kill each other. Love. Very good. Absolutely. Feeling accepted. We know that that's a basic human need. Right? Appreciated, feeling cared about. Absolutely. Being able to help each other when you need it. Absolutely. Knowing that that reciprocity exists and that you can call on them for help, um, whether it's like, hey, I forgot my phone, can you go get it, to uh, can you help rescue me off this mountain, right? Any direction. So we know that there are some really, really, really important benefits to having a relationship with another person, right? Um, now, what are the costs? Like, what are the problems with having any kind of relationship with another human being conflicts. Absolutely. So whether that's like, um, uh, like fighting, whether it's just like kind of like bickering, um, that can cause you stress, keeping their emotions in consideration. Um, they can betray you. They can hurt you. It's time consuming. That's a big one. Having a good relationship is time consuming. It's work. It is. A, even if you like the person, it's a lot of work, um, arguments, that person could try to kill you. There's all sorts of costs to, to relationships, right? But what social exchange theory says is that everything that we do tries to maximize rewards. So for example, our relationship with people, maximize that higher quality of life, feeling of belongingness, that reciprocity, and we try to minimize the costs. So we know that relationships are time consuming. They can result in conflict. They can be problematic. Okay. And the idea is, is that having relationships with people, okay, we kind of evaluate each one of them. And that social exchange theory says that we're going to pick people who we can maximize rewards with and minimize costs with. So we try not to have these kind of, you know, um, you're not going to, you know, try to have a relationship with a homicidal person because they might try to kill you. Right. So you're going to minimize that. Okay. Because that's high cost, low reward. And you're going to go to other people who you get along with better. Right. So we try to maximize that ratio of social rewards and minimize the, the social costs. Right. That's what we're always trying to do. Now let's look at this social exchange theory when it comes to helping behavior. Okay. So we know that there are costs and benefits to helping. Okay. And there's considerable evidence that indicates that people are aroused and disturbed when they see other people suffer. And a lot of times they try to help when they feel like they're going to relieve their own stress. Right. And so we know that there are reasons why we engage in helping behaviors. And sometimes those reasons for helping are selfish reasons. So like looking at somebody who's in, who's hurt, Okay. And it might be that you're helping that person, not because you feel for them as a person, but because you want to make yourself feel better because you couldn't live with yourself. If you walked away from someone in pain, right? That's, that's kind of a selfish reason, but it's helping behavior and you're benefiting that person. So we know that helping behavior has a lot of reward, right? So, um, it, you can gain rewards. You can, uh, get social approval. You can increase your feelings of self-worth. You can feel better about yourself when you help somebody. Um, you, we can look at this from the perspective of normal reciprocity. And that is if you help that person over there, chances are they're going to help you back. You can look at this as an investment in the future that 
I'm going to help this person. And maybe you're like, I believe in karma. And if I, you know, do this one good deed, then, you know, someone else is going to help me in the future. If I need help or um, good things will come to me. These are all things that we think about when we're helping people and other people, but that investment in the future means that if you are going to help this person, chances are you're going to get helped. And, you know, if, when you need it later on. So social exchange theory is looking at, okay, these are all the benefits of helping. But remember, social exchange theory is a ratio between pros and cons, benefits and costs. So what are the costs of helping? Well, you could be physically in danger for your life. It could cause you pain, okay? You could get hurt trying to help somebody. Um, you might be embarrassed. Uh, there was a time I was at a concert and I saw somebody, I saw a couple and there was this girl and she looked very physically like she looked like she was very drunk. And this guy was behind her and it looked like he was taking her necklace off. And I was like, oh my God, he's stealing her necklace. And I went up to them and I was like, what are you doing? And he was putting her necklace on for her, not trying to steal her necklace. And I was incredibly embarrassed because I was like, just kidding. Sorry, guys, pretend I don't exist. And I just wanted the earth to just suck me into a hole forever. So sometimes it's very embarrassing when you think you're helping somebody. Cause I was like, I'm going to come to her rescue and be like, don't steal her necklace. She's very drunk. And it turns out she's just very drunk and couldn't put her necklace on. And so sometimes you get embarrassed when you think you're helping and you're not actually helping. So sometimes when you walk into that thinking, I don't want to get embarrassed because I don't know what's going on here. Okay. It, it'll change the, that's a cost, right? Of potentially helping. When you have time to afford, your answer is going to be different. When you know that this thing is going to cost you a lot of time, you are going to change potentially your likelihood of helping. Sometimes it, there's a chance that you could physically be hurt to help somebody, but then sometimes the emotional pain of not helping is more powerful. So for example, when we look at cases during 9-11 and you had people who stayed with like a friend who was injured or couldn't get out, they knew that they could get physically hurt or die, but the, the pain of living, going on and leaving them, that emotional pain was actually more than them deciding to go on and, and, and leave them. So um, it, even though they wouldn't be hurt in that case. So there's a lot of, we, we have to weigh these things, okay? Do we have the time? Do we have the energy? You know, is it okay if we're gonna get hurt? You know, is that gonna outweigh, is that cost gonna outweigh the benefit? In that case, you're gonna be less likely to help. But if the benefit is, let's say you can save a bunch of lives and you don't, you're, you're like, that's more important than me getting physically injured, then that's gonna be you choosing to help over not helping. We know that helping is helping behavior decreases when the costs are high right? So um, if you are going to be risking your life or risking uh, bodily injury, the chances of you helping goes down because the, the, the cost is high. Um, social exchange theory, because it's a cost benefit ratio that you have to decide, social exchange theory actually argues that true altruism does not exist. They said there's no behaviors that you do that will benefit somebody else and not benefit you to at any, at any cost. Um, because people help according to this theory, when the benefits outweigh the cost. So if you say, well, okay, well, let's look at like, um, cases of pay somebody's layaway, or you pay, uh, like paying it forward for a meal and say the next person that comes in after me, I want you to, um, I want you to pay for that. I I'm going to pay for them. Um, or if you go to like Walmart and you say, well, I'm going to pay for three people's layaways who have, you know, Christmas gifts on that. Essentially you're paying for someone's thing I and mean, you're never going to see the reaction. You're never going to see what happens, but you're going to walk away and you're going to tell them, don't tell them my name. Don't tell them who did this. I want to pay for this. And I want them to have this thing. Now, most people would argue that's an altruistic act, right? Because they say, well, there's no benefit to you. Um, and that it's not like you're, you're going to be able to go and get um, notoriety or the people are going to thank you because they don't know who you are. Now, social exchange theory says that this doesn't really exist because the benefit is that you feel good about yourself. And even though, um, you know, even though you, you walk away and you've done that thing and they don't know that you did that thing, 
you know, that's still a benefit and that is going to outweigh uh, any kind of risk of, you know, losing your money or whatever it might be, or, or spending your money that, that benefit's going to outweigh the risk. So social exchange theory says that there, there always has to be some kind of benefit that has to outweigh a cost, whether that's feeling bad for leaving somebody uh, who's injured and you might get hurt, whether that's, you know, doing something really nice for somebody who they don't know that you did it. There's going to be some benefit to that. That's what social exchange theory argues. So in, in, the, in, in that respect, they say that altruism actually does not true altruism doesn't actually exist. Now I do argue with that. And I would say that I do think that it does exist. Um, and, and I do think that people, you know, there are people who don't get as much joy. They just do it because they know it's the right thing to do. So, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of argument there. We could debate that case to see if true altruism actually exists. Uh, but there are some who actually do argue that it doesn't exist. The final thing that I really want to, uh, kind of talk about today is, um, so, I want to warn you guys, there's a YouTube video on here. This is hard to watch. Okay. Especially if you, uh, you know, watching things with kids is, is kind of makes you emotional. This is a hard video to watch. Okay. Um, and so what happened was in 1996, there was a three-year-old boy who fell into, um, a gorilla, uh, enclosure at a zoo. Okay. And he hits the ground. Okay. And he's like unconscious and everyone's freaking out. Okay. Because obviously, um, you don't want a child around gorillas because they can be extremely aggressive and they can be, you know, very, that, that can really hurt someone. Um, they can kill grown adults. They can grab you by your, your leg and just kill you really pretty instantly. Gorillas are extremely, extremely strong. So in this video, and it's, it's the whole thing, you see it, um, the boy falls into the enclosure. So number one, he falls in and that's all, that's number one, like, oh my God, you know, is he alive? Okay. And then Binti, a seven-year-old gorilla comes and picks this child up and you think this is it, right? This, this, this kid's had it and takes the, the child to, um, so first it, she cradles the, the child in her arms and then she takes it to a door where the zookeepers are like, have access to them. And so it's, it's hard to watch y'all. It's like one of those things, especially if you have kids, you're just like, oh my God, um, cause it's intense. So the question is, is why did this gorilla help when there is no benefit? She could have, she, she could have picked the kid up. She could have left it alone. She could have, you know, stomped on it. Like why? would this gorilla do this thing? Okay. So one argument is that evolutionary psychologists would say that pro-social behavior is selected for in our genetic makeup and becomes a part of our genetic makeup of the members of many species, because gorillas are social creatures, just like we are. And so they understand that whole, like, you know, um, helping behavior and, and, you know, helping each other and communicating with one another. These are all things that gorillas do just like humans do. So it's in their genetic makeup as well. That's what evolutionary psychologists would argue. Now, social exchange theorists have a different take. So social exchange theorists would actually argue that because of Binti's past, that's the reason why she helped. So Binti had been rejected by her, was rejected by her mother as a, as a baby gorilla. And because of that received training and parenting skills from zookeepers and they rewarded her for caring for a doll. And so what they're saying is, is that because she had received reinforcement and reward, uh, you know, throughout her life to care for dolls and to care for babies and, and to understand how to, how to handle them. Their social exchange theorists would say that there was a great benefit for her to bring the baby or the young child to the zookeepers because she knew she'd get rewarded. So social exchange theorists said, Hey, we have a cost benefit ratio here, right? Where the cost was low, pick up this little creature. That's much smaller than you take it to zookeepers. And now you're going to get a nice reward. Binti does not die. No, they didn't, they, they didn't put her down or anything like that. Um, pretty positive. She was rewarded very handsomely for bringing that child uh, to the zookeepers.
you know, looking at even animals being able to help other animals and help people. Um, we see uh, animals, for example, dogs um, helping people who have never been trained. Um, you know, we always think of Lassie, right? Lassie going and helping Timmy's in the well, you know. Uh, but, you know, the social exchange theorists would say the reason why they do this is because they've been reinforced to do this kind of behavior, because helping gives you treats, it gives you rewards, it gives you scratches and cuddles, right? Um, whereas evolutionary psychologists would say, no, 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 this is actually ingrained in our genetic makeup because it's beneficial for the species to continue this kind of behavior. Now, the last thing that, I, um, that, that I'm just going to kind of touch on, this idea of empathy versus sympathy and the empathy altruism hypothesis, okay? So I'm just going to kind of lead in really generally here, and then we'll pick back up on this next class. So it's really important for you to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy. So empathy is a much more complex version of sympathy. Sympathy is like feeling sorry for someone, right? So, oh, they're in a bad situation. Oh, I feel sad for you. Empathy is more complex. It's putting yourself in someone else's shoes and feeling their emotions with them, experiencing the event. So if somebody's sad, you feel that sadness. If somebody's happy, you feel that happiness in the same way that that person is experiencing that emotion. So if somebody's really excited and something happens, really, really fun thing happens and you experience that joy with them and you feel that joy with them, that's empathy, okay? When somebody's sad and it makes you cry or it makes you upset, that is empathy. Okay. Sympathy is just saying, oh, that's too bad. I feel sorry for you. Empathy is feeling that emotion with them. And there is an idea that empathy is the reason why we engage in altruism um, and altruistic acts because um, of our connection with other people.